I, I know this is going to be hard. I know sometimes as we make the point, it may not seem like we recognize this is going to be hard all around. It's well, just yeah, it's hard, but we're yeah. in a challenging time. Yeah, and and so so if we reduce people's requirements, then where do we make it up? You know, that, that's 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 the big question mark with all these comments. Well, could you bring me in a lower tier? Okay, but it all has to add up to twenty five percent. You know, so suggestions about how we can make that up would be helpful, I think. Uh, Daniel, Hello, was I that like, followed by Paul Cook. I feel like I may be the um, last speaker. Oh, I guess, Paul, I feel like we're really close to lunch, so we'll try and be quick. Oh, that's right. It's one. Thank you. I yeah. haven't looked up. <laughs> um, uh, hello, uh, Chair Marcus and board members. Thank you for the opportunity today. I'm Danielle Blassett with the California Municipal Utilities Association. Our 40 water members provide water to 70% of Californians. Uh, so our members have been aggressively pursuing conservation measures in the past and we'll continue to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to help achieve uh, whatever the tier that our members are in. I did want to echo the appreciation for staff. I mean, it has been an incredible effort and you all have made yourselves available uh, via call and meetings and it, it's been a, an amazing effort and so I want to express appreciation. And they have um, to manage all five of us. I mean, that's, no mean that's, feat, really. It's been amazing so and really appreciate the accommodation and, and flexibility for that. Um, I want to echo some comments I've made in the past regarding messaging and outreach. I was reading an article that uh, just came out about today's hearing and there was misinformation about something that came out um, in a local paper um, on the online site. And so it's continuing to happen and it's definitely something where as water suppliers, you know, our members need assistance in making sure that that message is correct and it's out there and um, it's relevant and it's helping us all to get to the goals that we need to achieve. Um, you know, say uh, that again, and yeah. I'd be, I'll give you extra time. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do feel that uh, something that's been mentioned by a couple of folks, the uh, groundwater supply as a reserve supply, if if uh, folks can show through data and through other means um, that they are committed to conserving, but they can show they have four years of reserve supply through groundwater, we feel like that's an appropriate um, exception. They should be able to um, apply for that exception. Um, I did provide some language regarding um, compliance and enforcement um, that if our members uh, tried their level best and did everything they possibly could and still couldn't achieve the numeric target um, that they, they wouldn't be subject to a cease and desist order. I really appreciate the comments that staff had made today about enforcement flexibility and not wanting to fine. Um, you know, I take that seriously and, and I hope that, you know, our members will will um, also respect those comments and uh, we still would like to see the language, but we understand the, the difficulty with that. Uh, we'd also like to see a process, whether it's through the emergency regulation or the long term um, process of having the money from any fines that are levied returned to the community, uh, much like the SEP program where the, it could be earmarked for conservation activities just because, you know, we are, our members are going to be facing reduced revenue as it stands if there's a way that, you know, as they're working their hardest to get to the numbers, uh, that, that money could be um, uh, attributed and, and sent over for, um, for conservation. That Those are great. all good concepts. They're challenging to put into a, yeah. right, having both been yes. a prosecutor and prosecuted against yes. and done SEPs and yeah. facilitated SEPs, it's hard to say that out in advance without just right. saying you don't have to comply because all the money is going to go right. right back to you. But I get yeah. the concept. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then also we've uh, received comment from a number of our agencies about state agencies who are using water in their communities like Caltrans um, and the difficulty they have in trying to uh, navigate that relationship. So if there's a way that the state board can work with the Caltrans of the world um, to make sure that as you know our members are uh, communicating those restrictions in whatever they may be that uh, that they're able to include those agencies in that conversation because uh, depending on, you know, freeway improvement projects, whatever it might be, it can be a significant amount of water, so. That's true, that's true. And and they, on the, um, the flip side, are concerned because they're linear about going through multiple agencies and having different requirements all along the way. So there's a conversation right. there. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And then the last thing, um, coordination on the rebate programs, you know, something that a lot of our members have said, you know, they have very aggressive turf replacement 
um, programs already. We've been working in collaboration with the Energy Commission on their um, appliance rebate programs. But on the turf replacement, you know, there is a, a time where, um, you know, if you put drought tolerant plants in, you don't achieve the instant savings for, for water that right. you need to achieve. Right, right, right. And so just making sure that as the, the turf replacement um, uh, program is implemented, that that's all strategically coordinated so there's, there's no issues there and the, the realization of the water savings is achieved. So. Right. Fran's all over that one. Yeah. <laughs> And I think, I think with that, again, appreciate the staff's time and dedication to this issue. Our members are going to, like I said, roll up their sleeves and figure out what we can do to, to make this happen and, uh, and help you know, reduce water over the next nine months. So, Thanks. Thanks thank for you. the thoughtful engagement. Thank it's you. really helpful. Chair Marcus, can I just mention that the Department of General Services does have a uh, place on their homepage of their website where you can report water use by state facilities and they will follow up on it. We're also happy to coordinate. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Paul Cook, Irvine Ranch Water. I'm going to go until 115. Can people stand it? Does anybody have like blood sugar issues? I need to stop. Yeah, you do. All right. But you want me to let you talk. I go right? You want me to stop right now, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just in, and we'll take a half hour break when we do. Um, Paul Cook, followed by uh, Trudy Hughes. Thanks, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, members of the board. I'm Paul Cook, General Manager of Irvine Ranch Water District. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide comments for your consideration as you uh, consider adopting these drought regulations. And we understand and support the importance of achieving the statewide reduction of 25% um, as we enter this third, fourth year of drought. Um, recognizing the challenge uh, in developing easy to understand apportionment of the 25% statewide water reduction, uh, we actually kind of peeled it back and developed seven objectives of how we think we, what should be considered along the way. Those objectives, I won't read them off here in the interest of time, but they are included in our letter. Uh, we also worked with a consortium of other agencies to develop an apportionment model uh, spreadsheet uh, which meets these objectives, and we encourage the board to uh, modify the proposed regulations, if not now, then in the next phase to take into account these objectives. But I would like to highlight, if I may, three objectives or three specific areas of consideration. The first is the indirect potable reuse, which we've already talked about a fair amount, so I won't go too far into. But I think it's an important point to reiterate that by supporting IPR and recognizing that it is a, uh, is a great substitute for drinking water, you actually can support future projects providing uh, assurances to uh, communities who are considering making that kind of an investment the way we did down in Orange County. So I think that would be a great step. Um, second, and we've talked a little bit again about allocation-based rate structures. Uh, last July, uh, the board um, in the first uh, conservation round of regulations recognized allocation-based rates as a highly effective tool for achieving sustained demand management um, in urban water without imposing mandatory use restrictions. And, we just ask that the state board uh, include acknowledgement of this effective tool uh, in the proposed emergency regulations. Uh, the model that we have developed actually allows for really um, any kind of a rate structure that has uh, proven water conservation merits to it. And we, we of course, can uh, attribute a lot of our water savings to allocation-based rates. But it really comes down to a performance-based uh, water efficiency standard that we'd like to work with your staff in developing, uh, making it more concrete. Um, and our suggestion is to base that on a 55 gallon per day per capita indoor use, as well as outdoor use um, for drought tolerant plants uh, in terms of that, uh, that water efficiency standard. Uh, it is important to mention, as Danielle said uh, just previously, to uh, make sure you save a little bit of water for those great California friendly plants that have all already gone in. Don't kill those because we'll really uh, be uh, in trouble with our customers if they do the right thing and we don't reward them accordingly. Uh, the third item um, is uh, on the matter of extraordinary supplies. Extraordinary supplies um, are really developed, uh, and that's kind of a term of industry, to develop an urban water agency's supply reliability beyond its normal sources. Probably to more of a common vernacular, it would be more of an e just an emergency supply, but we call it extraordinary supply. Very few agencies in the state have created a true extraordinary supply of water, um, and um, part of that um, would be um, attributed to the fact that it would be for only in a declared shortage situation. So having the water but purposely setting it aside, I think, is a big distinguishing feature of what we're talking about with extraordinary supplies. Um, you're probably aware of the example that I'm going to throw out there, which is RWD's water banking program. Um, this was basically developed so that in wet years, we could obtain water uh, when it was available so that in dry years, our customers would have this emergency supply, specifically only during this time of dry years. 
and the way the state regulations are set up right now, we really can't move that water down um, because it's not, it's not acknowledged any differently than the rest of the potable water we would obtain. Um, so we'd like to encourage that this type of planning and investment be supported by the state board um, and that urban water supplies be allowed to draw upon extraordinary supplies, emergency supplies, if you will, during the time of drought to supplement limited potable water supplies uh, and that uh, agencies shouldn't be uh, punished for doing that in times of drought. So we, could, uh, we have provided language in our letter um, that would uh, facilitate this sort of an addition recognition. Uh, it's a little different than what Anderson was suggesting just now, but I was intrigued by their concept. And uh, perhaps if there was a way, we, I think a big part of it would be declaring that a certain amount of water uh, was set aside specifically for an emergency that was only brought down during a declared shortage, like say, our trigger was always the med allocation. Med allocation came a couple of weeks ago, so we're ready to move water, but for uh, the state board regulations. So we are ready and standing by to move some water. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, any unintended consequence with the regulation with respect to this emergency supply? If you can't use it now, what would you do with it? Well, for Irvine Ranch and our water banking program, if we don't use it now, uh, we save it. You know, and we, we certainly wouldn't, you know, move all of our water this year. We're, we would be in the same situation that we're all here in the state as how long is the drought going to go. But the bottom line is, is that we, 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 while we're in a position to move the water out of our bank, um, if that's the direction from our board of directors, we really, there's really no incentive to because we're being measured based on demand and consumption and things that we have in the regulations. So we'd like to see the recognition. Um, otherwise, it kind of makes the investment that we've made uh, in the water banking facilities and the effort to save, it's almost a pre-conservation. We conserved the water a few years ago and put it aside. Now we really can't have access to it when we need it. That's and, the concept. And if you don't use it now, then I, I guess what I'm looking oh. for is how would you use it in the future? Would it end up, uh, uh, you'd be able to um, in, in increase use instead of conserve in maybe a normal year? We're just looking for how this would play out. Right, well, we, we've, we, designed and implemented our program to not be a supply project. It's just an emergency reliability project. So I'm confident that we're going to be able to work with your staff and find the right solution to able to, so we could actually go back to the original design, which is to our ability to move water. And other agencies, if they have this sort of program, could move water during dry periods. It's really, it's really a savings account analogy or a prepaying your mortgage analogy was the best one I could come up with. You, you prepay in January and and then June or July rolls around and you want to skip a payment or and apply that one and you kind of can't. So it's, uh, that's kind of where we're at right now with our program and we'd like to see the board uh, hopefully acknowledge that. And, uh, so, so the way, the challenge of moving it is that it counts against your numbers? Yeah, it wouldn't measure any differently than it would for potable uh, water use. So, you know, and, I mean, there's things to be designed. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, you could bring that water down and cap it a certain amount. You, you couldn't, you know, completely uh, make up for all of the uh, cutbacks that the state board is requiring, but you could make up some of it. And there's, there's things like that that we'd love to work with your staff on. But I how think would, there's a solution there somewhere. How would and, you, I'm sorry, yes. go ahead. No, no, it's good. How would you distinguish this emergency ply from uh, what others have been talking about with respect to desal and recycled water? Well, we love recycled investment. water too. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, well, in, but the investment in say IPR, I mean, it's an investment, it's a program that you say, I could, I could have this kind of water and it's less expensive, or I could spend a little bit more and have this kind of water and make that investment, uh, which is really the foundation, kind of the big decision about the groundwater replenishment system that was made 12 years ago. We thought it was gonna be more expensive. Turns out it's actually very competitive. Um, but we knew that that water would be here, available for us in Orange County, in a drought, so we made that, and sometimes you just make that decision to spend a little bit more, um, and it's, so our water banking program, um, which is up in the Kern County area, is an investment. It's, it's water that's located you know, up there, but we spent the money hoping that we could get the water available down here when we, when we needed it. But what I'm not hearing is, um, what I'm worried about, and the same is true with IPR or, or any of those new water supplies, that they not be used in, in ways in which it's really not productive to the state of California. Right. And, uh, and, and I don't hear that. I don't hear your saying that, that, that you're, you're looking at that too. 
What exactly did you want me to say? Because I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is being not, it is, not it, on overwatering lawns. You, you, as if I, I'll, I'll let you work on it over lunch. But uh, the, the second thing is is uh, with the information about what's happening on the Colorado, and uh, as well as what's happening with snowpack. I mean, we are in extraordinary times. We're not in in the worst case scenario, we're in beyond the worst case scenario. And so that's something we have to think about as well. Right. It, even when we've saved something for what we consider uh, extraordinary right. um, no, no supplies, argument. We, we may, it, may, it, it may not be enough. And so, you know, we've got to think this through. It may take a little, right. little no time. No argument there. It's, it's, but it, because of the extraordinary times is that we actually have put the water aside and we can move it down here. And it's, you know, again, the trigger, we had no intention of moving water down to Orange County to Irvine Ranch Water District until Met had declared an allocation. I mean, so we have a sequence through Met, through Municipal Water District of Orange County, we have a sequence of contracts that would be, start to trigger all of these movements to get our water that we have in the ground um, 200 some miles away down to Irvine. So that, that's the kind of things we'd like to think through with you. Right. I think for us, again, just to, and I know now people are hungry and I'm going over, but this is an important issue and you all have been leaders for longer than anybody else. Maybe, Mike, we can, guys can duke it out. Um, but what, what's front of mind for us is this Australian experience that we may replicate. Maybe it'll rain next fall, everybody will be mad at us. But if not, we're going to be really happy we saved every drop wherever it is. And so where I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around is to the extent we give what's known as a credit, I totally get the train of argument that you planned ahead for it, you should be able to use it, folks have invested, whether it's DSAL or IPR and, and all of that, but regardless of where it comes from, our thinking and our where the ball is that we're looking at is how do we extend urban resiliency for multiple years so that we're not in even worse times, and so it's hard to see from here how to do it. I get I get the concept, but then there's this countervailing concept. So it is it is definitely something to talk about because we don't want a perverse incentive. Although I can't imagine someone saying I'm not going to de develop more reliable water, especially as right. we're living through the most unreliable period um, that we've seen in a century. So uh, it, it's gonna, just going to take a little time to figure it out. Totally open, but I'm having trouble figuring it out in the short. Yeah. There's instance. lots of shortage scenarios we considered as we thought through, but all of the solution scenarios we thought about as to how we would move water and how much were all multi-year kind of um, solutions that we went through with our board. We actually have a board policy that, that defines the capacity we're right. targeting over a three-year period. So, right. it's, so we was, probably have to look, sit down and look at the math. Right. Does, does that, you know, when you're talking about moving water, does that influence your calculation of water produced? Is that what you're getting down right. to? Right, it goes right to it. Okay, and, and is that something staff that, I mean, you know, in terms of how we account for things and calculate, you know, because if you're moving water, you're not using it per se. You're producing it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused by the concept. So I, I, know, I know we are um, over for the lunch Come on, <laughs> break, Max. and there's, there's, th th this can get a little bit in, into the weeds. I guess so. So as I'm hearing, uh, Mr. Cook, it's that uh, as soon as Met triggers an allocation, you know there are certain steps. The the overall Met allocation is 15 percent. What is that? What what? Is the cut to Irvine is 15 percent, or we, is it more? Well, we share in that cut because that comes from Met through our wholesaler, Municipal Water District of Orange County, and then down to each of the retail agencies. So that's a whole set of uh, limitations. What happens with extraordinary supply, which is a, it's a, it's really a Met-defined term, that water kind of comes around, if you will, uh, legally. I guess is the best way to say it. It kind of goes around that allocation process because it's already been set aside for that emergency situation. Right, what I'm getting at is what's the determination that because you've been reduced in your MET supply, which is some portion, it, that's a percentage and not all your water comes from MET, why is that cut by necessity a trigger for increasing your supplies on hand instead of just a, a demand reduction? Well, it's both. I mean, we do certainly have demand reductions as well. But for, for us, it was the uh, knowing that the allocation would, there would be space in the conveyance system through Metropolitan so that we, they can actually be moving water through the capacity that they had. So it's, it's sort of a practical question of moving water around when there's room available to move it. Does, 
a lot of moving pieces in this. But you're thing. moving it. The, the key is to move it, not just not to use it necessarily or use it when all. Production was a term that uh, the, 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 the regs use, so production oh. is all the way through and using it, yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I think the, the concern from staff would be why, why is it necessary uh, to move this water at this time? Um, I, you know, I know that Irvine has a, a fairly low uh, gallons per capita, uh, you know, use rate. But th the question is, d does this water need to be made available given where we are um, and what more can still be done uh, on the conservation demand reduction side? As opposed to moving it down and getting it into your basin for future Moving. use. Well, right. right, getting it into our service area for use. You know, I mean, the why is, you know, we take very seriously uh, the state's directive and the governor's mandate and $10,000 a day um, doesn't fall on deaf ears when it comes to RWD. So we really want that to uh, to be something we can work around. Well, and I think we're probably going to be, this is, we'll be talking about this th throughout the day. Um, but what concerns me is uh, the disincentive, you know, the, so you're correct, what's the need? But at the same time, if that ends up being the standard, what's a water supplier going to do when they're looking at projects, you know, in the future uh, for investment? And so I, I'm, I'm just concerned about that piece. Okay. Could I have Fiona Sanchez say a couple words too? I know it's lunchtime. It's just it, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an important issue that we're going to address I, I just anyway, want to so make a ahead. quick comment specific to your question is why is there a need? Um, in analyzing our water use, and we've made, taken a lot of steps to really reduce, our current allocation is 16%. Um, we recognize that recycled water isn't included, but in our service area, almost all our outdoor non-residential is already recycled water. So we don't have opportunity to conserve there or very limited opportunity. So what we are faced with is having to really um, push our residential use down to below even the level for drought tolerant. We're getting, cutting into our residential, residential indoor use, and currently we allocate them 50 gallons per capita per day for indoor use. So we're cutting into that, and then probably we're going to have to cut into our indoor commercial industrial use. So this seemed like a perfect opportunity to not necessarily supplement our entire supply, but to bring down some of the water that we have invested for the particular purpose of an extraordinary situation, bring that down so that we can still have a lot of cuts. We've already um, planned cuts to reduce our allocations further in our rate structure and significantly increased conservation programs. Our intent of this water is not to supplement that in any way. We will have very increased aggressive programs. But in order to not cut into our CII and bring our residential down to a almost health and human safety level, we thought that it would be prudent to use some of these uh, extraordinary supplies that we've invested in. Well, that sounds to me like it falls into that uh, number 16 in your uh, resolution, in the resolution. Yeah. Okay. And, and we can certainly continue this discussion. All right. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you for the time thank you. and all the good work. Good Trudy, discussion. you have a choice. Would you, after lunch? Do you just want this whole room to love you, don't you? Okay. Um, we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock.